All the Rockland Planning Board order. The audience participants and from general public should be aware that any or all portions of this opening meeting may be recorded by audio and video resources. All some of this meeting may be rebroadcast periodically by WRPS or other outlets. Persons wanting a DVD copy of this meeting, draw a contact WRPS, the Board of Selectmen's office, a small fee will be charged. Uh, first thing on the agenda here, we have uh, a more business site design for the solar field at Sterling Golf Course. Uh, they've asked to be continued to I, I think we're going to be pushed out to September 26th. So. All right, uh, and the new business, we had a, a minor modification for our level academy, the Hunt Parkway. Is there a mic anywhere, or just need me right here? Right here? Yeah. Right Everybody seems to have a mic. Uh, no, not that fancy yet. <laughs> so for the record, Kevin Grady from Grady Consulting representing the applicant um, for the Level Academy. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, see that too? Yeah, Mary's filming. Tonight's mm -hmm. meeting, so probably that people can see. Yep. Thank you. Sure, no problem. So the applicant is requesting the planning board modify that site map approval to reduce the amount of pavement uh, in the parking lot and eliminate the full circular path around the entire building. What they'd like to do is create some green space in the back of the building over here. Uh, this section here is where the cafeteria and general uh, library area is. Uh, there's windows out here and this is one of the main areas for the students to uh, gather. So they'd like to create green space here. Um, they met with Deputy Chief Peeney and discussed this. And basically what they um, arrived at is that we would extend the pavement up 50 feet on each side of uh, the, the easterly side of the building and then terminate it. We would retain the compacted sub base so that if a fire truck did need to or an emergency vehicle needed to come up this way, they still could. But it's basically going to be, um, it's going to look more like a lawn and it's going to eliminate the pavement. So again, the, the goal of that is this green space at the, the exit here. <coughs> I also have one other item that I wanted to uh, discuss real quick too. Um, on this approval section, uh, conditions number three, um, it, it reads, the applicant will put privacy fencing outside the buffer zone, southeast corner, on their property running around the perimeter. Um, and basically, that's this whole side here. And I think the way it reads, it's all the way around. Uh, recently, the applicant has um, acquired this parcel. And what they'd like to do is just put in a four foot uh, chain link fence on this side because it's a retaining wall running down this side now. Um, there, there's just woods here currently. So there's not giving privacy to any of them they actually own that. So we're wondering if the board would consider a four foot fence in that area. And, and the way this is written, it's not completely um, uh, it's difficult to completely follow, but I think you understand what I'm, I'm saying. So the retaining wall down that whole length of the property? <coughs> Correct. Currently, it's all it's woods. It's 150,000 square foot, 148,000 square foot lot. Um, the residential abutters are here, here, and back here. So we could wrap it um, or, or tie it in here. But there's no uh, <coughs> abutters on this property. Now, 
week now that the <coughs> applicant has acquired it. So those are the two things we'd like to modify if the board is wanting to. Do you have any comments? Nope, just a comment. I wrote in the letter of the conditions. I wrote in the letter if you meet those conditions, the fire department has no instructions. Okay, and uh, we sent off the deputy chief's comments to Pat Vernon, and he confirms you know, it's acceptable as long as the fire department has no issues with it. Randy, do you have any comments? So it's going to be grass? Correct. Taking on asphalt and putting in grass? Correct. The fence that was going up that whole side, what was it before and what did that be? It's, it's specified as privacy fence in the yeah. approval. A um, little big, but we have, we have cedar down this whole side. It's, um, the Frasers are here. And then um, I think it's chain link with the um, privacy screening on the back. And then this would probably be the same, but instead actually would prefer the view to the, to the woods that's there currently, instead of blocking it out and giving this, this area some, some more air. Is there nobody out there? No. This, this is a vacant lot that, um, these guys just acquired. So there's no butters to, to impact on that parcel. This one, there was a reason for a privacy fence before. That's all I'm saying. So in oh, yeah. a while, all of a sudden, it's okay now we can have something to do a different type of fence when we okayed it when we had it that way before. Sure. So the purpose was to protect the abutters from um, impacts, uh, site impacts. So this is no longer an abutter. It's a it's owned by this this parcel. We still uh, actually this fence is all in. I didn't see this fence in, but this one's. So we we respect the residents and the abutters, and we want to give them privacy um, over this side. It's there's no longer an abutter. Even the previous one, we had some small discussions that it was industrial and whatnot, but we just decided to go with privacy fence to separate the two lots. And I guess you could condition that if there's any tree clearing or anything here, they need a privacy fence, you know, on the next lot. But we'll be back, I guess, if we do anything on that lot at that point. <clears throat> I have no problem with the green space addition. Um, the problem I do have is that southerly exposure um, is that that is definitely not a good situation for those neighbors. It, the fence, the privacy fence, I don't think it's there yet, and I don't believe any of the plankings are in yet. So yeah. my big thing is. That needs to be heavily planted, and that privacy fence needs to go up. Because the, that southern exposure is almost encroaching on all those neighbors. Okay. I think the privacy fence that. is up, right? You have the um, chain link with the fabric on it. I think what he's referring, yeah, I think what he's referring to is this, this buffer, this, yeah, this buffer. Yeah, so you want that enhanced? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the only way. No, I don't think I have a problem as long as that southern side is put up with a problem with the privacy fence with either one of the, the uh, items coming. Thank you. Yeah, I concur. I have no problem with removing the asphalt, making more green space. And just uh, make sure you just put the fence on top of the retaining wall. Yep. You know, you know just 
do what you have to do to keep your neighbors on the southern side happy to accept the privacy fence. Understood. And the permission is okay. And, yeah. and, and all, the, all the landscaping and everything that. Because we're going to keep tabs on this. Yep. Because I have concerns about it. <coughs> Understood. I will uh, relay the message and Perfect. make sure we enhance the plantings and screen that as best we can. Okay. I, I have a question. I know the fence is up along the south, but it's a chain link fence with the, with the fabric on it all across the back of the property. What I'd like to know is, are they going to, are you giving them permission now to move that fence or put a gate in? I mean, I like it the way it is so that far. That fence is going to stack. The fence we're talking about is on the easterly side. Yeah, but so you, this is, you, you're talking about ripping the pavement out there. And just here. Kevin, if I'm not mistaken, the pavement is not, the base coat is not in the back. It's just compacted material back there. Correct. Um, so that will now be... Um, Loom, crushed stone, and some seed is what's going to go back there. And I asked for the compaction testing, so it's already graded to have heavy machinery on. So our ladder truck can be supported. So there's no asphalt being ripped up. Just to yeah, you're talking the north side is the back. Well, I'm calling the uh, southern side the back. Oh, oh, I'm yes. sorry, the east side, you're calling the back. I'm calling the south side the back. Correct. So this what? is the, this is what we're calling in the back. I don't know if you can see that. That's that's what y'all call on the back. Yeah. This is well, you, the driveway yeah. entrance is here. So, yep. That's the back. And, and I know there's a fence inside. right across. What y'all call in the back now? Yep. And the fence that we enhance the plantings. So we'll yeah, you have no plants on changing that fence. Nope. In the back. Okay. Did you have like a communications box there? Anyways, I don't see how you put. Yeah, no, everything that's installed, is, we're yeah. planning on retaining. Okay. Do we have any other comments? <coughs> uh, excuse me, what's your name, sir? Somebody Dave, just... Dave Frazier, I'm not one of them. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mike Roberts, Park Street. Um, just a couple of questions. So they don't have any plans putting the gate for the easement? For or anything for that fence? There is, uh, there's no easement here, actually. This is part of the parcel, I believe you're probably referring to. Um, and my understanding was that we didn't want to have access to go in and out of there when we approved this. Um, I could yes, ask. I know the other meetings, they said that there would be no access there. They have the fence up now, and there is no access now. Actually, before they put the fence up, they got robbed over that. So right. they really don't want to. I would think they wouldn't want to get there. I definitely don't want to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Uh, so on the east southern side, uh, there's a butters to the south side of your uh, property. I haven't seen a retainer wall or the four-foot fence. You know, with with the ending headlights going into the uh, abutters property, out of just east to the end of the south side of the property. So the uh, actually no, I'm going to answer these. Yeah. Um, this is limited access. It's dead end. The main uh, traffic is here. And oh, there's no there's traffic on the east side. At all? It's emergency uh, access. Oh, okay. Few deliveries, um, but and then there's a privacy fence here, six foot privacy fence with the uh, okay. mesh on it. The deliveries, every daily deliveries on that. On I'm sure side. they're still working out. Uh, you know how often it's going to be. It's probably daily. So it varies vendors so between. Man. So, just because my neighbors are not aware, most of them are not aware of this meeting here tonight. So, my concern, if there was one, because these houses here that are abutting the property, will there be headlights going into their houses are on, on the east side, you know? So. No, because we have, there's privacy fence along the back. This is a road to nowhere. This, this is a road to nowhere. So, traffic is basically going to come in. Move around this way, or go to the parking lot, and 
and back so out here. Yeah. It's a it's a road. It's, this is basically it's green space. Green. It's green. Oh, space. so there's no traffic on that it's side at all. Correct. Oh, thank you. That's where we eliminated the pavement. Right. Okay. So now they can't drive around the building. Right. Okay. Excellent. Is this? I'm sorry. Is there a proposal to put soccer fields over there on that side of the building? We haven't uh, applied for anything. So they're trying to figure out what the use of that <coughs> property would be. <coughs> I have a question. Mary Parsons, 754 Union Street. Back in 2018, 2019, they were supposed to put up a six, six foot high opaque fence and, on that driveway, and they haven't done it yet that I know of. All I see is a chain link fence that's not even that high with um, b black backing. I think that is the chain link fence. No, they were supposed to put up a six-foot-high opaque fence. That was in the plans. That's what you guys decided on. And I think that's what the black, sh the black fabric does. Is it's not six-foot-high, and no, it was not to be a chain link with a black back. A, maybe I can clear it up. There's some of the driveway. They said they were going to do it all along the, the private property, but they didn't come all the way around the corner. I think she started right in the back. Yeah. But we're not talking about this property, you're talking about the ramp. Well, the driveway, the driveway leads yeah. to the Lovell Academy. And it's all of the driveway, not just the section of it, all of it. As far as I'm aware, we've complied with the uh, approval. We've discussed it with the zoning enforcement officer, fence viewer, anybody who's listed as having any kind of um, authority over that. Fence. We've worked closely with the town on choosing materials. Uh, we didn't change that um, outside of the approval. You know, we're even here for, you know, even tonight for discussing modifications. You know, I don't think we've changed anything on that. Have any comments? No comments. I'd like to address your comments, Mary. As far as I know, now, thanks to your building inspector. He's been happy with everything that's been in there. I, I believe they've complied with the rivers in there. I don't have a copy of that. It's a little too long ago. They did say that they would, at one time, he said, abutting my property, they would put a fence up there, a privacy fence, along wherever residential property was on that address. But that's, I'm considering that a different project. That's the, that's the rinks, but the driveway does go to both places. But they, he said that they would put, they would have, somebody asked him, would you have a problem with putting a fence there, a privacy fence? And he said, absolutely not. But that was quite a while. I know we had that discussion here, and I know we talked about fences on the entranceway to the uh, arena. We decided that the one place we needed was on this last curve over here, where the you know it's down off of this page now, where the cars turn, so the headlights turn across the residential lots, and that's where we placed it. And then again in the parking lot facing towards Russ Connor's yard. We, um, the zoning enforcement officer is supposed to go out and choose where the fence is to go, and I believe that has happened. All right, on, on this issue, uh, how does the board feel? I'm going to make a motion to approve the door as far as removing the paper. I'll second. Yeah, we have a plan um, to uh, modify the fence on the Houston portion of the container line. Include that in the same motion, please. I guess where, where it butts out, uh, where <coughs> remove the privacy screen and keep the fence. Yeah, at Cessna's uh, parcel 14 6 along the easterly line here. And that'd be the front Additional plantings. Sure. So, yeah. 
Gender is uh, Union Point, and uh, I'm going to have to lose myself for this. So, John, all you. Who is speaking for Union Point, please? John Lucas. I, if I could do a quick intro before the development team comes up. Okay, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Tom Henderson, 402 Allentown <coughs> Street, Rockland. And the chairman of the South Build Redevelopment Authority. I'm here with <clears throat> Kelly O'Brien McKinnon, the other Rockland representative uh, over at the South Build Redevelopment Authority. It's uh, very exciting to be here in front of uh, the planning board that I serve with some of you on. And uh, it's nice to be here after a few years of uh, trials and tribulations over at Union Point. And before I introduce the development team and the lead of the development team, you know, the project. You know, some people might say what's been going on the last few years, and the team is going to get into it. But ultimately, just to give you a little history, is back in 2019, after we had gotten rid of the developer, actually in 2018, but we went through an RFP process in 2019. And just so everybody knows, we only had two development teams submit a proposal, and this went out all across the, the country, this proposal, or the request for proposal. We got one group out of New Jersey that was similar to the previous developer that wanted to do piecemeal development and just be in here, in and out, and kind of leave us in the same position we've been in for probably the last 25 years. But we're very lucky to have a development team between Brookfield Properties and New England Development come in here, submit a proposal, and work with us at the SRA, and also work with the three towns. The team is nothing but professional. The thing I could say is, Honesty is, is what they're about. You might not, not like to hear the answer, but it's honest about what we have to deal with at the base now and in the future. This team has committed to making sure they look at all aspects of the base, infrastructure. We know it's like water and sewer for 25 years. Traffic impacts, not just you know in the su surrounding area of Wayne Street or Route 18, They'll talk about it, but they looked at 72 intersections across the South Shore. This team is committed, they're determined, again, professional in what they do. They've had a great success here and across the country between Brookfield, their national partner, and the local development team in New England Development. I can say this. I don't know if there's any chances after this, because honestly, if this team can't pull it off, I don't know who can. They have a great team of experts that are looking at all the aspects of the space. Again, they'll talk about some of the infrastructure. But the biggest thing why we're here tonight is just to do an introductory presentation to the planning board because we will be coming back to do a joint, hopefully a joint public hearing between the Southfield Redevelopment Authority and you people in preparation for town meeting in November, a special town meeting. And I hope we can move this off the mark and get this development back on its feet and, and get it moving for development. So. Before we got out into the community, we want to make sure the planning board, we, with the selectmen uh, two weeks ago, we want to make sure the planning board gets to see some of the information. And I'll turn it over to John Tuig, who's been a lead from New England Development, and thank you. Question, Tom. Tonight, you're just going to the planning board for presentation and information. You're not looking for a decision from us. Correct. No, just information, just a, an overview, and no vote, and later down the road, sometime, end of August, September, September, possibly September, we'll be looking at doing a public hearing okay. uh, to review to make, a more critique of the, of the zoning. I, I just wanted to make sure we know exactly what you're looking for tonight. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, possibly the board may want to move out to the floor so that they can see the screen. Right there. Oh, perfect. I'll turn it over to John Tewitt from New England Development. John. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> 
Tom took my whole introduction, so I got really nothing more to say. Uh, that's all right. Um, the record, my name is John Tewitt um, with New England Development. Um, we do have the presentation actually on two screens, much kind of nice. I mean, that uh, really uh, works out well, so I think I'll probably point to this one a little bit. Um, thanks for having us. Just to clarify, I just repeat what Tom We're not looking for the board to take any action. We're going to <clears throat> give you a presentation that you're going to say, well, this really isn't normal planning board stuff. But our thought was to tell you a little bit about who we are, a little bit about what the vision of the base and sort of what we've been doing and what kind of timeline it looks like. Rather than, as Tom mentioned, we're going to have a formal planning board notice public hearing, go through the zone, do all that. That's going to be, you know, it, it, it probably based on the dates from uh, September. But there's a lot of complicated issues associated with the base. We thought it would be interesting if you haven't seen some of the background to see it. More for information and so you know where we're coming from. So you don't just try to hit it cold and say, well, there's a zoning bylaw. What does it all mean? What context is that? So that's just sort of set the stage about what we'd like to do. Part of that is to tell you who the project team is. Um, so Paul, if you could, uh, if you're going to advance the slides, we can go through. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, New England Development, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit. And normally, you don't talk about yourself and so what you've done. But again, given the history of the base, it's failed four times. Where it is today, if we're closed on prior developer, we thought it was important to at least you know who we are. Um, and talk a little bit about Brookfield properties. The team that's here, Paulson Cod, is behind me. Uh, Robert Pierce from Brookfield is right there. Um, and then Tony Green, who worked with us on Pine Hills this year. So that's sort of the development team. It is a joint venture between New England Development and Brookfield Properties. Now, key consultants. Um, Dumont Janks, uh, formerly for Society of the County of Dumont, so he does our uh, planning and our space planning and sort of thinks about the design. Um, Bob Gaylor is the lead site civil guy from Tetra Tech, worked with Bob for a lot of years, knows this area. He's actually a native of Rockland. Um, and, uh, he uh, is our uh, lead site. So transportation, Jeff Dirk and Vanessa Associates, you may have seen in other contexts. Um, fiscal, which is a little bit unusual when you have fiscal. The reason we brought on a fiscal consultant, RTG is probably very naturally known. Mostly works with municipalities and state governments. We asked them to do an analysis for Raymond, Rockland, and Abington of the economic impacts from the project costs, tax revenues based on tax rate before we might develop. And what was very unusual, and one of the reasons we hired them, is you never, you project out for a project, but you never actually have a project and form the base. And if you think about it, we have 1,274 homes in Wayne. It really is the start of the project, so understanding the costs, the revenues, it was a really helpful way to then try to extrapolate that and look at Rockland, also look at that. So we'll, get, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. And then the other person who's going to speak to you tonight is Tim Sullivan, who's right up there. Um, Tim's our zoning council and self developed the zone. We've spent months working on the zoning with the SRA development. So that's our team. <clears throat> a little bit after the team, what we want to cover tonight. And again, it's a little bit different than your standard planning board agenda. Obviously, a little bit of, of the introduction, which I've talked about. What we've been doing since site selection. People ask us, well, you guys got appointed a while back. What have you been doing? I won't talk to you a little bit about that because it really does matter to the developability of the site. So we'll talk about that for a Timeline and process, you ought to understand where we're at in the overall timeline. I didn't want you to, again, get the zoning out of context. I want you to see the zoning when you see it, be able to ask questions about where we're at. A little bit of vision. Now, I'm not, Ricardo really does that. I'm just going to do a little bit about what we're thinking about the vision of the space should be. We obviously can't talk about Zoning, Tim's going to talk about that because that's ultimately what will come before you when you'll be asked to give a record. A little bit of the technical studies, Tom mentioned it. Um, we've literally done thousands of pages of technical studies between traffic and storm water and other things. I'm just going to touch on some of the key issues that everybody talks about. Water, sewer, transportation. A little bit of the benefits of our vision and then obviously less answer any questions that you have. So that's what our hope is. I am not going to read these words, so I'm just going to go through New England Bell. A little bit about New England Bell. New England Development was founded by a chairman about 40 years ago, Steve Carr. He's still our chairman. Originally, it was a regional shopping mall. Most of the malls that you see there are done in New England. They're now owned by Simon. We go. Um, New England is a very parochial place. If you want from here, they don't like you and they don't want to talk to you. Um, so there was a high barrier of entry. A lot of the national mall companies were 
when you were building regional shopping centers. You really weren't. If you weren't from here, you couldn't explain it to communities. So Emerald Square Mall, all kinds, Solomon Plum Mall, all kinds of different malls that you see, all in the North Shore, every one of them in New Hampshire, we built millions and millions of square feet of regional shopping centers. And that's originally what this company was. We sort of morphed out of that about 20 years ago. We sold them to someone. Because we saw even back then that things were changing in the regional shopping mall business. And then we went into things like Nantucket, we went into golf courses, a couple other projects I'll, 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 sh I'll show you. We went into doing outward centers. We still have some regional malls, but all kinds of different businesses that we worked into. I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that we did because we just, I, I, we picked University Station. You know Amtrak Buffalo 128? You know that where the Wegmans is? We brought Wegmans to Massachusetts. We've done five out of the six Wegmans there in Massachusetts. The reason I show this project as an example of what we do and how it relates to Union Point. This was a failed project that had been foreclosed on uh, by Anglo-Irish Bank. Um, degree of fraud involved um, by that the project was planned to be a five million square foot center, completely collapsed. All the permits and approvals had expired or had been appealed, all were wrong. There's a lot of similarities actually to the Union Point today. But what has it become? About 120 acres, it's a mixed-use project. We did about 2 million square feet. If you go up there today, you'll see the retail center. You'll see housing. But we did two different, both condominium and rental housing. You're going to see a lot of medical buildings. We actually just signed two weeks ago with Dana Farber. They're going to build a new brain cancer center there where they actually shoot proton beams to kill dangerous brain cancer cells. Uh, Citizens Bank Regional Headquarters are there. It's a very much a mixed-use project that we took completely repermitted at the largest town meeting the town of Westwood ever had. We happened to have five towns that we were dealing with, because if you think about that little site, Dedham, Northwood, they were all kind of ringing around it. So we've got a lot of similarities to what we're talking about. That project, we're almost done. I did Dana Fiber was one of the last pieces we're done, but here's an example of what we did. Another project we do is Cambridge site. If you know Cambridge site at all, if you know Cambridge, Cambridge is, is one of the malls we kept. Uh, I was but a child when I started working on it in 1990s uh, with Steve Carr. It was really cool at the time, three levels up, three levels down, right on the canal. We rebuilt the canal with a million square foot regional shopping center. What have we done? About five years ago, we went into the life science business, both in manufacturing and research labs. So the old Sears that was here, Sears is now all a life science building. The Macy's building, which I'll date myself, the old Filene's, we took that building down in October. Well, it's under construction. If you go by there now, you see it under construction. Um, it's going to open in October of this year. In the old Leachmere building, and I'm really dating myself, anybody knows Leachmere, uh, and bought their first camera there. But the Leachmere building, again, that's actually going to be a residential building, and then next to it with a parking garage is a life science building. So that's a little bit of what came with. It's the idea we've owned this property for 33 years. It's a little bit of, the reason I, again, I stuck, it's a little bit about when we go and say how we've kind of morphed into other things, but also we own and hold for a long period. Third correct here, this touch on is Pine Hills. Pretty commonly known, and certainly in this region, Pine Hills, 3,000 acres, 3,000 residents, about 2,500 of them are built. It's certainly a award winning project, kind of gives you a sense of what we're doing, Master Plan 25 years ago, we were not in that business, so we morphed into. So that's a little bit about New England Bell. A little bit about Brookfield. Brookfield, depending on the day, is the largest or second largest real estate company in the world. Uh, I know I get this number wrong where it says 211 billion assets. It's actually $50 billion worth of assets. We do plant communities, a lot of commercial work. A very interesting company, not here. One of the reasons it's a joint venture with New England Bell, this is in an area where they have developed. New York, San Francisco, other parts of the country. <coughs> so we're very happy to have Tremendously well resourced, a good partner for us to have 50 different master plan communities. A couple of examples one local in East Cambridge, residential units, research and office, hotel, uh, over a million square feet of space. Another one down in South Carolina, I put that on the list because it was, again, a master plan community much bigger than the one we were here, but just give you a sense. Second thing, it's a little bit about who we are, and I, and I hate the commercial part of that, but I think it is important for you to know sort of a background. What have we been doing since site selection? Probably four things we've spent a lot of time. And working with Kelly and Tom, who have been outstanding representatives for Rockwell moving forward. And I don't say that just because they're here, they have been. I'm going to tell you a couple of 
this is done. Land ownership, I'm going to explain that to you. Coordination with the Navy. The Navy, this is still for the BRAC site. The Navy still owed money for this site, they still control it for the site. Redoing a redevelopment plan and then creating the zone. That's probably the four things that we spend on most of our time. But let's talk about why they matter and why does the planning board care about that. When we were appointed, we call this affectionately the Humpty Dumpty plan. This is what we got for ownership. What's in yellow was Washington Capital Management, which was an agent for the property. That's what yellow was. That's what they foreclosed on. That's what Elstar lost in the foreclosure. Okay. Everything in pink up until the end of last year, the end of last year, was owned by Elstar. Roadways, water and sewer infrastructure, everything where the habitat is, a lot of the open space. It was still owned by Elstar up until the end of last year. The Navy is sort of this, we call this the teapot parcel. The Navy was in here and in other places. And then we had the Coast Guard parcel, which is up in the corner of the University of Coast Guard. You may or may not know or remember that was actually auctioned last year uh, by the General Services Administration. We talked about how to use it on it. We supported the SRA, so the SRA could vote. These are people who were trying to buy it, but not looking out for the good holistic nature of the base that we were trying to figure out. You know, what could they stick on there in the short term and try to do something? So we helped the SRA buy it, the SRA owns it. Um, so that's sort of the hodgepodge, though. We really, when we got it, we couldn't develop it. Because if you don't control a lot of the open space and the habitat, and you don't control the infrastructure, um, you really can't do much. So we had a few hundred acres that were car washing down. Now, two big things happened. One, the SRA, we supported and worked with them, did an eminent domain taking, and took the land away from us. Everything they could see in there. They also, as I mentioned, we worked with them in the Coast Guard, they would buy the Coast Guard. We have a deal with the Navy, the Navy has to transfer everything to the SRA. We have a deal with the SRA, the Navy gets us to do the transfers to the master property. So we started with Humpty, Humpty Dumpty. We go to the next slide. Humpty Dumpty's on your left, look what's on your right. Everything in the blue, we have a right to acquire as an or otherwise controlled by the SRA, or controlled by the Navy with an obligation to the coast. We can't develop what's on the left. We can develop what's on the right. That was probably, and, and realize that happened at the end of last year, so not that far away. But it took us that kind of time to reassemble what the base was, because the base, the post foreclosure, the base was just a <coughs> really good. Thing. So that's probably the biggest thing that we spent. The next thing we spent time on was the Navy. Not sexy stuff, not exciting stuff, but working with the Navy to say, wait a minute, they get a payment every year. We made one in, in March of this year. It's millions of dollars of their own. That money went back to Washington. So we convinced them to allow that money to go into an escrow account, stay on the base, and take that money, let us design a PFAS treatment system to do watering on the base, which as of March of this year, so Months ago, they agreed to do all the things last year and this year on the escrow, and that's what we're doing to this. A big issue with the Navy. It doesn't sound, again, very sexy and exciting, but it is a huge issue <coughs> for the base to be able to move forward. The second big thing we're working on. Third thing was the redevelopment plan. The plan sounds like it's a plan, it's not really a plan. It's a narrative, it has a plan attached to it, and I'll show you it's not much of a plan. But it sort of talks about the history what the different land uses are, you have to do a fiscal analysis, how are you going to handle infrastructure, how are you going to handle open space. This space has had a lot of plans. Um, the last one was a ridiculous plan. It was a plan that said, in this zone, we're going to build 193 units in this zone, we're going to build 187 units in that. Anybody who's been doing this for a while will tell you, you will never be able to guess what type of use is going to go on a particular area. Even if you think you're really smart and guess it, when the tenant or the buyer comes along and says, well, no, I want to tear, I want it over here. It never works. It was so specific that it was doomed to fail. And it did. And it, there was no question it was going to fail when it was written. Our plan, obviously, is different. We'll show you a little bit more. This is this kind of gives you a, 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 a macro level. We, when we started thinking about the plan, we started thinking about, well, how can you create open space all around it? What's in orange there is that which has been developed. We didn't want to touch that because people have bought and built there. So the 1,274 homes are sitting in that. What's sort of in the tan is that which hasn't been developed. That gives you on a just sort of a very macro level what the land use is and where things work. Okay, so we developed that piece. All right, so that's what we've been doing. What's a timeline actually look like and what did we do with a lot of that information? 
as you look to the next slide. In January and March of this year, uh, in March 15th, we got the redevelopment plan approved by the SRA. Okay. So they took our redevelopment plan and our narrative and said, okay, we can do it. They then approved the zoning bylaw and map, which Tim will show you. So we had to go through that. Now that was after months of going through with the council, getting commentary, public comments on what we're working on. We also submitted in this period the technical study supporting the zone. That's the traffic report, the storm report, all of that. <coughs> now, April and June, May June, we spent about 88 days with our friends and women working through ordinance committee, planning board, with unanimous support from the planning board. We got unanimous support from the ordinance committee. We got a one zero zero vote in June 26, a few weeks ago, to approve the zone. So that's what happened. Now, as we sit in July and September, what are we doing? A couple of things. Um, getting ready for town meeting. Introducing this concept and information to you, trying to hold some of these introductory meetings. And we're meeting with council on aging, and we know this like a couple of weeks ago. And I know the Open Space Committee is here. We're going to be meeting with them over the next week or so. I've talked to issues. We're also preparing a NEPA fund, a state fund, um, that deals with all the issues, transportation, all the you know, different technical issues we have to deal with. Because the last report they filed was in 2017, which contemplated almost 4,000 housing units and 8 million square feet of commercial space. The problem with that development they submitted is 8 million square feet. I don't know if you ever saw the plans or if you remember them at the time. I, I affectionately call it, it somewhat looked like Dubai, the spinning building that was 20 stories tall, and the man-made lakes and all that. All very interesting. I grew up here, I don't know where that is. I mean, it's certainly not here, but it's I maybe mean, somewhere in the world. Um, not a real plan, not a plan that actually there's any fire. As we move forward, Pat said it's going to be done by May. We have Abington, Town Meeting on October 15th, with the Rockland Town Meeting on October 15th. That gives you, when you think of the timeline, and then 2024, what happens in that? Well, that's the first thing that we're going to do. You think of the timeline, and then 2024, what happens in that? We have to finish MEPA. We're also, and I didn't mention, working with Natural Heritage on habitat issues, open space related issues, working on those. So we'll kind of do all that, and then we also have to amend the legislation to the state. Uh, Speaker Mariano actually came out to Weymouth, uh, talked about water, which I'll touch on in a minute. Uh, but the legislation refers to LSTAR, has plans, has that plan that says, I'm going to build 197 units of this type. That's all going to kind of wash away. So that's sort of what we're doing. A little bit of timeline, who we are, what do we do with the land. Mercado will give a much better presentation than I'm about to give. But I'll give you just a sense, because again, the idea is a little bit of introduction, a little bit of thing. Touch on four things. What was this? Well, pre-1940, probably the 1940s. Um, Huckleberry Hill, wooded, pre-World War II, that's what this area was. Go to World War II, they pave about 800 acres, they create the storage, the base. Recently, when you look at so sort of what's there today, you look at, you know, where are those 1,274 homes, where's the rec plex and things, okay? That's what got developed over a period of time. Again, still leaving a lot of the runways, even the turnaround area, okay, that's what's there. When we look at that, what's our big idea? And this is sort of why I called it the vision. Uh, you know, we jokingly, but not really, call it runways to greenways. The idea of you know, distant orientation is the hangar. Thinking about the spaces of being able to turn these into greenways so that we're connecting a very large northern open space with a large southern open space and building and developing along those areas. So to connect and reconnect some of those open spaces. That's sort of what the big vision is when we look at this site. How do you actually make that work? It's also one of the reasons in the zoning we created a buffer all the way around. One thing that's not on the plans, when we were in Weymouth and the Coast Guard piece, we created another buffer on the Coast Guard piece. We didn't own it at the time, so it doesn't. Which creates sort of a core development area, and this is a different sort of a big view. Northern <coughs> open space, southern open space, where do you develop? Parkway comes through, gets the T station. You know, how do you develop? Where do you put your density? Creating a town center along the parkway. Anger just for orientation. And that's been what is the great thought? Higher density right along the parkway, right along the green space, lower density. So 
that, that sort of information. Zoning. Tim's going to talk about some guiding principles on zoning. Don't change what's already there. People bought and invested. Don't change their zoning. The zoning is a mess. One of the biggest complaints we heard when we talked to people about developing here was we don't even understand the zoning down there. It's 32 different overall districts. We don't know how to do it. So simplify the zoning. Create a place where in this section of the zoning, Tim will speak to it in a minute, that's where we follow the rules of the world. So again, this is introductory, but we'll spend a few minutes and I'll ask Tim to So, as John mentioned a few times, you know, this will go through the typical zoning process, planning board here and the like, and this is intended to be an introduction. Um, and John spoke a bit about adopting a redevelopment plan, a little bit about, you know, the vision. The zoning is really an implement, tool to implement that, those concepts. And it, it really does it in two parts. There's a zoning map and zoning text. So with respect to the zoning map, it's proposed a couple of things to highlight. Um, all of the zoning in areas that are currently developed stays the same. So where properties are developed and people own things, the zoning is not changing. Um, there's going to be one consolidated open space district around the perimeter of the, of the base. And there's one new mixed use development district, part 7A, in the area that's left to be developed. Those are, that's really the zoning. Keep the zoning the way it is for people who have property there. One consolidated open space district and one new mixed use district for the areas left to be developed. The second part of the zoning is the, the text, the, the zoning dialogue. And it also implements the redevelopment plan and all the general provisions of authority and purpose and definitions and the like, those all, those all stay the same. Um, the rules of the road, again, for the people who own property there, those stay the same. Um, the bylaws administered by the SRA. The, the real change in the zoning bylaw is to have one place to look, an Article 7A of the Mixed Use Development District, for the area that's yet to be developed. So, so here's, what I'm, here's what I mean on the zoning map. So on the, on the left side here, this is the current, current zoning map. And, and a few things to note. Um, it's a mess. Uh, it's it's been developed in a way to try to be extraordinarily specific in very different areas. So there's multiple underlying districts, there's multiple overlay districts, there's multiple open space, multiple commercial, multiple residential, and it's all a guess at where things are going to be So what you can see is on the right, this is much more consistent, you know, with the plan that John showed a minute ago that the SRA approved. So you see open space district around the perimeter. You see these districts here where property is currently owned and developed. Those are the same districts that are there today. And then you see a mixed use development district in the you know, beige tan with the, with the hashing. So this is what's being proposed. Open space district, existing, and then mixed use development district. So that, that's the comparison of the two. The two and then just quickly on the text, this is the, the new district, the mixed use development district. And again, one of the important things is, if someone's going to come and develop at the base, you know, they'd have to hunt around for the various provisions. This is one place for a lender, for an owner, to look for the rules of the road for what's left to be developed. So this is, it's one place to go. And it's designed to encourage a mix of uses and, and flexibility. Um, and like you, you'd expect, there's prohibited uses, a lot of uses, dimensionals, all, all the way. Um, one of the big things here is there's a package of master development plans. So this zoning is supported by a master development plan that shows where development might start, but also a fiscal report, a traffic report, stormwater report, all of the, the backup that goes with it um, is part of the zoning. And then when a piece of development goes forward, the SRA looks at, is this piece consistent with all the impacts in all of those reports that are that's really a highlight of the zoning. More to come as we get into the process, but um, that's an overview. That's my last slide. Right? I'll pass it back to John. Oh, great. Thanks, sir. Um, we're not going to go through the technical studies, but I mean, people obviously want to talk about you know, water, sewer, transportation, infrastructure, water. Um, infrastructure, water. 
Um, let me tell you a little bit about the water story. Um, Weymouth has some water, but not a great deal. Rockland, Abington, our water challenge, which is all based on the Based on the 2017 study, the idea was that the Bay Spring, right, we call this a sweet Up here in purple, those are all the MWR routes, because the, the MWR route has plenty of water, 100 million gallons. But it's up in the Blue Hills. You've got to take it from the Blue Hills to get down into the basin. And you'd say, well, why do you have all these different spaghetti points, different loops? As you might imagine, running a, a line in front of the social plaza is not as exciting as you just think about the coordination ability, how many feet you can actually lay on a given day, versus, and they say, well, why do you have a plan that takes you down through Randolph and around through here? Ease of running a bike and the ability to be able to actually do more in the day. So we actually looked at those issues working with the MWR. A couple things have come up since even the original final in 2017. MWRA has agreed to waive the entrance fee if you become a member of the community for the next 20 million gallons of food plus. So, not as good. Speaker Mariano and the state are interested in supporting this idea of bringing. MWRA water down to the south shore, inclusive of bringing it down to the base. There are about two routes that they've really focused on, sort of in the middle area. One starts as Quincy and it comes in, the other is Quincy. Weymouth has realized that although it has excess water projecting out from this one, one of these, it doesn't. So they're interested in becoming an MWRA. So your representatives of the SRA, Tom Kelly and others, have joined with Town of Wayne and made a filing, or about to make a filing, to become an MWR region. Remembering the SRA is a quasi-municipal agency, that's a really actually a water company, can kind of do that as, as a way to bring water to the place. There are a lot of issues with bringing MWR region water as it relates to cost, time, communities have to travel, design of the pipe, actually laying the pipe. A lot of issues. I don't have an answer on that. A couple things I can tell you about. This development, one of the reasons it's failed so many times, everybody always looked at it and says, well, if I get another 50,000 gallons, I can sell a couple of lots and we can build it on the We will not, we don't look at it that way, and we won't do so. Here's the problem. We know to be able to make everybody whole over the woods to fall and to do all this infrastructure, what it's going to cost. You can't build a couple of buildings and pay for that. I mean, kind of simple economics. We look at the base holistically on all of these issues, water sewer and transportation issues. We can't solve them and solve them permanently. We're not going to do the So we're working very closely to try to figure out how we're going to get that part of work and get a more of time frame that will allow the base to move forward. Second thing we're looking at, Paul Quebec, if you will, um, is aquarium, which is the red roof. Um, down in Dighton, Massachusetts, there is a desal plant. It's controlled pretty much by the city of Boston. So you brought had to build that when it sort of ran out of water to be made to actually fund it. Um, it has a max capacity of about five million gallons a day. Brockton doesn't use that. Do something. Use some of the But certainly not five million gallons a day. So, and this was in the 2017 report, the idea of and we're required to study not only in the RA, but also the Aquaria. The opportunity of whether that water could be brought up, uh, Brockton has a 36 inch pipe next to Peaceful Meadows. Let's not cry about peaceful metals getting much in the August. I know it's a lot. And by the way, I mean, talk to my brother about it. We got to talk about it. But anyway, um, this is 36 inch pipe for Brockton Mills. We get Brockton supply all the water we're looking for that. It's a straight shot, about three days in the fifth of this. So we are in discussion to that. That has some advantages to it because it also, there are neighboring communities like that in Rockland, and so there might be some water. Yeah, we don't necessarily have an answer for it. There's a lot of study that's required, but those are probably we did actually look at could you get water on the base, could you lift water up? We had we have people out there trying to figure out how many gallons could you get a day out of the base, about 150,000 gallons a day. Not great. Um, doesn't really work for us. So we build up you know, maybe 10 times that. So but we looked at all the alternatives, these other ones. I'll 
stop on that. We could go on the water. Sewer, we're very sewer challenged. Um, yeah, Weymouth is a, is a very sewer community. One thing that your SRA representatives did was failed infrastructure on the base, but it was owned by Elstar. When we were able to do the eminent domain taking, get it back, we actually fixed uh, the pumping station that was there. It was pumping four times the actual gallon, almost 400,000 gallons a day, now down to 800,000. So we created 300,000 gallons of capacity to sewer. Um, Rockland, you folks know better than anybody in Rockland. Where's my story? We don't yet have an answer for that. I, I answer it for other things. Continuing studying that. And then Abington, which a lot of the sewer, 95% of the sewer works for the park. And that's the Abington. So we're continuing to study that piece. Stormwater, again, we looked at this holistically. Bob Dale and his team developed a stormwater system for the entire base. Uh, obviously, the runoff rates, all that. Uh, he's you know, submitted a stormwater report that looks at the different things that might be. And then finally, the last one is transportation. This is, uh, you know, Tom mentioned this. This is Jeff Dirk's 72 different intersections that we're studying. Um, and they vary in different things that you have to do in order to repair them. But just on a very macro, sort of high level, if you look at the MEPA approval in 2007, we predict about 35,000 trips. If you look at 2017, what I affectionately call the Dubai plan with the 20 story buildings, at 80,000 trips. The plan that we're looking at, and we just sort of had to assume, uh, Two million square feet, 6,000 homes. If you did that plan, you have to pick a project when you're doing traffic to about 48,000 trips. So more than the 2007, a lot less than uh, 2017. What that all dictated in the, in the reports are traffic signal timing about 10 locations, intersection widening about 12, roadway widening at four, traffic coming at another four, about 30 intersections for that to be done work too. Again, looking at full build out of the base. But that's sort of what the technical studies are. I mentioned it early, and I'd like to go through it just very, very quickly, fiscal and RTG. Because people often ask, well, what's the money? What's the advantage for the community to look at this? As I mentioned, we had an unusual case. We actually had a, you know, a subject to look at, namely the 1,274 homes and the 2,400 residents that are here today, that they had 16 to 17 school age children. They have so much commercial space against So we asked RKG. Analyze it if we built it up. What, what would it look like? And we had them look at residential build out, commercial build out on a per acre basis. What would the revenues be based on car tax rates? What would the cost be? Go interview, please, fire, do we know what would the cost be to do it? Look at it, what's general government cost? Look at all that. What would the school age children be? Um, and we, we did one thing before I go through what the conclusions were. On school age children, which is always bugaboo, when I first started doing this, everybody would say residential is bad, I don't want school kids, I don't cost a pound a lot. That was the standard. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would tell you yes, that's true. That is not true today because of how we are living, the amount of children that we're having, the type of housing that we're building. Just, you know, people get older and the, the, our, 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 how, how we function, how we look at life. But that all said, we told them on because knowing that the sensitivity would be there, we said don't assume the school age children percentages that you see in the base today. Go into Rockland. Someone built a 10 watt, four bedroom subdivision. What was the school children percentages that you look at? They're much higher. And we said when you do the expenses for the net revenue calculation, use those numbers. Don't use what's in the base. Now, we believe what they will be what's in the base. And we tried to overstate expenses and understate revenue. Parks I showed you in Westwood, when we originally did that, almost, Paul and I did that almost 10 years ago when we started, we predicted $7 million worth of revenue. We're at 11. Um, our school children is still, I think Paul, the same number. Uh, it, we, we predicted it at, not the number they predicted it at. Because what we have found is it's much better to understate the net revenues than to overstate them. Because the best thing that we have, I mean, we've been going for a long time. We've been doing this for a while. I, I you know, started out as a team craft lawyer 30 years ago plus. The only calling card we have is the last community we were in. And we invite and ask people to call where we were. So we have to always deliver on what we promise and not over promise. So that's how we looked at that. It's a little bit of an advertisement to understand how we work together. 
Okay, so go to the next one. This is Wayne, 174 homes. Assessed value, $400 million. Gross tax is 5.3. They've got, when we figured out police fire, all the costs about $900,000, and they have some bond payments. <clears throat> they have a roadway going through a lot. The net to Weymouth on an annual basis right now is what's built on 3.2 million. It's a really good indicator of the type of things we might receive going forward. Primarily they're residential only. So when you look at that, and by the way, there's a whole report that goes with this. I'm just giving a summary chart. When you look at Rockland, we estimate 4.1 to 5.5 million dollars in full bill value for net tax revenues. And why do we have two columns? One says 75 percent commercial, the other says 75 percent residential. We ask them to weight average and to say, okay, if most of it was a commercial development, and we're commercial developers, so that's what we do. We said most of it was commercial, what would the tax revenue look like? And most of it was residential. By 25 split, either way, what would that look like? You can see in this particular case, but it is the nature of uh, sort of costs and expenses today to get a higher residential. So they have to get a higher tax. But in any event, significant net new revenues to all the communities. If you look at Weymouth, they're getting 3.2 net today. You know, their number is lower than 20. Um, uh, last two slides. A little bit about why. Why is this important? Why does it matter? It should be probably what the slides We've got to stabilize the base. It hasn't had the developer for several years. Uh, I never knew some of the things that I've learned about uh, that people actually come in with rider mowers on um, their trucks and unload them and race parts of the base. Never knew that. That's, that's a thing, by the way. The Brazilian Kite Festival, which quite honestly is an excuse to drink all day. Um, but they sell, yeah, they sell, they sell, put up some nice kites. The base suffers from, as much as the SRA is trying to, having that degree of open space untenable. Now, we're actually increasing security there. It's not something we have to do, but we want to do this summer to try to control some of that. But everything from the curbing, how it's operating, to what's going on there, when you have hundreds of acres open and nobody there. So that's really relates to some of the deficiencies. All the local and state permits have to be. State permits refer to um, uh, 500 vehicles coming out the front door in 18. That's nothing. I mean, I think it was 1,274 residents. So all, this, all the state permits have to be redone. They defaulted on the natural heritage permits. They defaulted on the escrow accounts. They're all. Infrastructure. If you don't solve the long-term water, sewer, transportation, and the project, as I say, we're not going to do it if we can't. We don't have all the answers yet. It's going to take us some time to do it. First step is to create the zoning of the fabric from which we can develop. Open space permit buffers, I showed you a little bit about that, flexibility. And then the fiscal benefits for, for Rock. Those were the benefits. So last slide. What, 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 where do we go from here? What's next? Well, we're going to seek the zoning approvals for Weymouth we got. Rockland Abington, hopefully by November, because we have November in Rockland, as I say, November 7th. Natural Heritage, we're working with them on an open space proposal. Um, we hope to present that to the open space committee with some more detail. Uh, we're talking about, about increasing the amount of restricted habitat. So habitat turtles don't want to sort of mine, but I kind of guess where that's going to be. Um, and to create contiguous space um, as opposed to a little bit chopped up. Uh, we're working with the MBTA a little bit on some multifamily zoning. Everything has that issue with the relationship with the uh, We're working on that. We're working obviously on MWA and Aquarius, I mentioned. MassDOT, we're meeting with. Um, the public private partnership on what can be done, and also as it relates to the T-stop, or the other figure, I would say. Um, our goal is to have our final approvals in 2024. We'll be working, as I mentioned before, in, in 2024, primarily regarding legislation, financing, how we do the project for. It's an ambitious schedule, um, but it is one where um, we think the base has real opportunity. Uh, we think we have a good sense of, we get a lot of support, 700 people signed a petition to support on a lot of our average community meetings, 150, 200 people. Um, so there's a lot of desire to, to move this forward. And, and we hope in, in Rockland we'll get uh, that same level of support of all the base redevelopment that is in Wayne. That's true. It is what it's going to But there's not an insignificant amount to, uh, uh, to develop both on a commercial and residential basis. So I'm going to stop here. It's a lot of information. 
But again, I think you see why we wanted to kind of, you know, we didn't want to come in cold to say, let's talk about the zoning bylaw. This is a little bit of background. So what would we do where we are? Okay. Randy, do you have any questions after? Has anyone lost it all on that? Now, uh, maybe in transportation, there may be some ultimately can be looking for transportation improvements, but not directly. We're right on the line there in the top right. Um, is there a plan to make an extensive presentation at town meeting? No, we're talk we're obviously going to have to talk to the moderator, but uh, that's our intention. And what, what we're trying to do in the interim is to get out and start meeting. We have a bunch of next week and the following week. Some community groups are going out to Council and we have people like that. To kind of, and we have that. We have some going on in Abington. We're going to schedule a community meeting too, which we'll just you know, for people to come and, 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 and hear and sort of understand uh, that. Uh, yeah, we, that, that's going to be our program. So, so what do you think? Yeah, did you pull hardly in, in the project? I just think that. The message needs to get out and get out loud and try that. Um, in your transportation, or your, I guess, broad transportation, are you including any roadways that are just not on the base now? Or so, uh, oh, yeah, we can fit in Rockland, but uh, most of the of the um, 72 intersections are in fact not on the base. Um, we actually worked with, um, I, I think Rockman was able to get a, a mass works grant, and we participated working with the SRA on the funding for the match for that. So there, which is you know, some of the work that has to be done over on the 228 side, uh, and then looking at that. And I know eventually talking about a TIP, but we want to work with Rockman and see if there's ways to either get another mass works grant to fund the past design, the really working on design, but for ultimate could I somewhat assume that that would probably be like Hingham Street and the mm -hmm. little park drive, mm -hmm. which are severely narrowed now compared to what transportation could be on it with the base building? Yeah. And, and one of the plans, which I, I know uh, at the time your assistant fund manager was talking about a widening project there, mm -hmm. and we're sort of going through uh, when we first looked at it, um, really uh, was not ambitious enough to, especially as it flared out to the intersection. So so, in regards to that, so the, the, the stuff that you're working on now with the highway department and Mass DOT, is that for current projects or is that for build out? Well, we'll build out. It, what, what Mass DOT wants to hear about and what we're required to do on the MEPA, they don't allow for segmentation. You can't just talk about well, in this phase, we're going to do this. We'll actually have a total build out. We have built everything, every piece of, uh, of the base out. What would that, and then we talk about how you would phase that in as you go along and you know, as you advance phases. We also expect there's going to be discussions with them about the computer rails. Uh, we did a project, and they're doing it now, um, up in Alston, you know, where the uh, New Balance is, and where the, we own the 10 acre site right next to the, uh, the computer rail station, and also you know, Alston Yards, the yard as well. They're our first building under construction. But a lot of that discussion was how can you increase the ridership that's there because stops on the South Station, and we ended up doing an MBTA agreement over the next 50 years, where as we increase size of the project, we actually help support financially, so they have double-decker, so they increase frequency. It's that type of thing, and we kind of envision that, you know, as we add people here, we're going to have to do that. So it's not just MassDOT, it'll be MassDOT and MBTA. Um, they're going to have to both be looked at and be supported. Uh, because we want to be sure, so if you're, if you're selling a transit-oriented project, Parking and you know, people have to have adequate train trips, uh, the size of the uh, what they're using for the trains. All that. I'll open it up to the public. Anyone in the public have a question? Yeah, a question for you with Name regards and address, to. Please. Excuse me? Name and address. Oh, uh, Jack Egan, 38 Webster Street. Uh, you keep mentioning Aquaria Water. Now, I haven't met with those people probably eight or ten years ago. And I'm, as you know, maybe everybody in here does not know, that's their backup emergency supply water. 
in case they do lose the water at the other locations. Uh, they have turned down multiple municipalities to date. And I think anybody, based upon what they told me back then, I think it's still uh, good now, uh, it would be political or legal suicide to enter into any agreement to sell you water out of that facility. Now, have you had other discussions with them that they will sell you that? Yes, and um, also you may or may not be aware Brockton is also considered buying the plant. They what? Buying the plant. From the plant. So that's a yeah. We've had. A, I'm not going to disclose the discussions we've had, but they're extensive and they've been going on for quite a while. Okay. But that's the minimum amount of water they need to run the everything, the fire department, and to give a proper water supply to people if they lose their other sources. So I don't know how you're going to work around that with them. I think they'd be sued by the other municipalities they turned down on there. I don't know about that, but they have um, a certain gallonage that they can currently produce, and they have an additional gallonage that they could produce with certain water. Okay. There's no water. Now, when Elstar was running uh, Union Point, I had a discussion offline with the MWRA. They said to support the base, it really needed a home run line from their facility into Union Point. Um, they're not insisting on that anymore? Okay, because they were talking $100 million and minimum of 10 years to do it. I'm not, I'm not going to say they're not still talking $100 million, but it is a different view, especially if the SRA and Greenman are our MWRA communities. It's a different way of looking at it. How, where it would connect and how it would connect would be different. Wouldn't just, you're talking about the sort of direct pipe uh, uh, process that's not necessarily what we're talking about. Okay. And since you're taking a holistic view, if Rockland can't supply sewer, the whole thing is dead? Well, you said you need to solve it for all three communities. We do, for an ultimate build-out. Um, but whether there's Rockland or an alternative solution for Rockland, th those are things that we're looking at. I couldn't hear you. An alternative solution for Rockland. Rockland's got a significant sewer issue right now. Is, um, are there alternatives to that? Are there abilities to be able to address issues that they have with their system? Um, are there abilities for Rockland to become uh, that part of the base to be serviced by the MWRA sewer system? I'm not saying any of these are necessarily the answers, but there are multiple ways to look at it. Okay, but to go with the MWRA, you still don't need a new pipe. Because you have capacity issues right now in Granger. We do. We do, and we've studied that and uh, had discussions with them about the pump station and what would have to be done in order to increase it. But you're willing to put up over $100 million to get this thing rolling. The total infrastructure budget, certainly on this, for water, sewer, and everything else, certainly exceeds that number. Um, we are also, as part of working with Weymouth, uh, to the extent that the state has an interest in creating additional water infrastructure for the South Shore. Some of those monies may be, be able to be funded by state programs, which would be right. Because if you think about all the South Shore towns, none of them have any water. Well, I know they, they want to go down to the Cape. So, you know, but that's going to cost that's rather ambitious. billions and billions of dollars. Yeah, that's, 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 that's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about an incremental approach to be able to bring water in this region. That's what MWRA is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I worked for a water company for 39 years, and we had a situation where a large development needed water that we couldn't provide, and they got it from another town, and they wheeled it through our town, and it was nothing but nightmares because mm -hmm. our customers that were paying a very high rate for the water were getting a vastly inferior water from another town, and it was because you can't if you. Putting it through town, you can't separate it. It's going through pipes, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of, lot of backlash, a lot of trouble. People didn't want to be paying the high rates for an inferior quality of water. And it was just a nightmare. I don't know if that, if you can do anything about that. But it was, 
absolutely horrendous. Billing, uh, quality of water, everything. Um, yes, um, the issue of, I think the mayor of Weymouth thinks he's going to wheel water to the base. I know the SRA has a um, written agreement to help pay for engineering for Weymouth to go on MWRA water. It doesn't say anything about the uh, Union Point, Rockland, and Abington. And I was at the December 5th meeting with the MWRA, which the mayor was at, and they told them they prefer a dedicated pipeline. So what are you doing about that? I, I think a couple issues uh, is water to the base, and then there's water to Weymouth, in which we are part of Weymouth. Um, the prior discussions, the traditional filings, all dealt with sort of that direct pipe solution, the pipe directly to the base. Ultimately, in the SRA, if Weymouth were not to support that, were not to support joining the MWR, for whatever reason, that is an option that would be there to do a direct pipe. Current discussions are bringing the water to Weymouth in the region. We would be a customer of Weymouth um, as part of the base as an owner of property in. That's not how the MWRA sees things. Each town is separate and would have to do their own separate thing. And I think you also, if you're at that meeting, know that there were some discussions about if the other communities become. MWRA for purposes of the base. There was also the discussion at the SRA as a water company. And as the overarching quasi municipal agency, does it supply water? We don't have all the answers to this yet. What? We don't have all the answers to this yet. We're working on it. It's, it's like a little chess match and sort of go forward a little bit, try to figure out where we're at, keep going. Um, I think there's a lot of willingness to try to find a solution for the region. In a positive way, that's what we're trying to do, and not just sort of throw every issue down and say, don't do that. Because that's the only way this is going to get solved. In terms of Aquaria, they're going to be coming through Abington, and now they're going to be wheeling water. Because that it's a joint waterworks, so we're going to need to know how that's going to work. Our, our sense is at the moment is that that, would, that solution would be a pipe, a bait. Different solution. Any other questions from the public? I have a few a couple of them, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess the first question, uh, John, by the way, it's great to see your presentation again. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the first question would be if the planning board votes on the zoning changes at some point down the line, uh, September or whatever it is, uh, do they lose all control of the whatever goes into the Rockland section of the Union Point after that? Well, the SRA, as, as it is today, the SRA has control about approval of a particular project that goes in. What is different about this zone um, is it, there's a multi-part process. You have to actually go through the massive developer. If someone has a project they want to do, they want to supply land to them. That goes through the massive developer process. Design, does it all fit? Is it in keeping? Then they have to make all the filings that you would normally see and test them against the filings that we've given. Does it fit in with the transportation program? Does it fit in with the stormwater program? Um, is it fiscally positive for the community? All of that has to be handled. That goes through a permit process the SRA. As it is today, the SRA is the permit granting authority on the base. That's not, and this issue was raised in, in, in Weymouth. And people who are less familiar with the base said, well, does the Weymouth Planning Board make all the decisions, for example? No, and that's never been the case, and that's not what the legislation says. It is a redevelopment authority of which Rockland has representatives who sit on the board. That's the way it's And that we're not changing. John, if I could expand on that, uh, to the chairman, to Mike. The, the SRA does planning, zoning, and conservation. We'll continue to do that. That's not changing under the current zoning. 
and then all the local permits as far as building inspector, electrical inspector, plumbing, that all is done through the individual towns. Stays the same, is not changing under the zoning at all. May I follow up with Don Pan 64 years in a minute? I don't understand why um, towns would want to give up their uh, ability to review and to uh, in inspect and enforce to a board that mostly is people that don't live in those towns. Actually, uh, Donald, it's made up of two people from Rockland, two people from Weymouth, one person from Hamilton, and then two residents that actually live on the base, a labor representative, and a chamber of commerce representative for the board. So that's the makeup. So it's a it's a broad overview of the of the entire base. Now, when uh, this this has been the way we went back to Tri Town. Tri Town was the permit correcting authority back before, and then when the legislation changed, it, it remained with the SRA as the permit granting authority, with the exception of the local permits. Which as far as building, zoning, uh, at that point, when we were considering uh, the Columbia Navy Station as one unit, but now we've divided it up mm -hmm. into three towns. And what about the taxes? Is, uh, is, is, is the, the, the town will be collecting taxes yes, as well. usual? It, it hasn't changed since the 2014 legislation. The 2014 legislation, which these gentlemen did not present, the previous developer did, is how they divided it into what, what you want to say the three towns, but that's how we, it used to go. The tax revenue prior to 2014 went to the Tritown Corporation and then get distributed out as far as different payments. But now it goes back to the individual towns, which it has been uh, to the point where when we did the eminent domain take taking, Rockland was made whole on their back taxes by the SRA and the development team that, that LSTAR did not pay for $303,000. So the, the, will, the, will the assessors from Rockland uh, be involved in assessing yes. the property? Yes. And if uh, a tax title situation goes, it's, it, it will be the, the town. Yes. So only the, the zoning, the conservation, mm -hmm. and, the, and uh, the planning, uh, the towns give that up. They didn't give it up, though. Nobody, they, they're not giving it up. They didn't have it. They, that's what the SRA was created for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, Tom, just to follow up on that a little bit. So it was the SRA, which was one community then that was going to split the taxes and everything else. And that's when the SRA got, you know, power of uh, conservation planning and whatnot. So now that's three different towns totally taxed to Rockland, taxed to Weymouth, taxed to Abington. It just, you know, it's up to, you know, it just seems that Rockland should have some control over the planning on the property. They did it in Westwood. Westwood, yes. Westwood was part of the yeah, process, I think, at yeah, University right. Station. Yeah. This was never controlled by, or at least hasn't been since World War II. This is a BRAC base. It's owned by the federal government. That's what it, there's no, and federal government supersedes every other, every local authority. That's what oh. this is. And it, when it became, and it's still probably owned by them, Tritown had, legislation was created to be able to do the redevelopment of the base, which vested these rights in a redevelopment authority, which is now today the SRA. You can't, what was changed was that the community's got two major benefits. Taxing authority, all that direct receipt, the ability to be able to issue building permits, collect fees, and control those issues. So that sort of now sits with the towns. But I wouldn't want you to think about, oh, well, it's now all three towns. It's not. It is your redevelopment authority has a who it oversees a development because it really is a place. And you have to think of it as a place. And if you think of it as, well, it's this piece of that community and that piece of community, which is very hard to do when you're standing in front of a community and say, you can't think of it just myopically as this is a piece of rock on a high audit control board. Because it's not. It's the federal government based a redevelopment authority. The advantage is the towns happen to get the tax revenues and the building department control of it, which is great. But you want to develop it so it looks and feels and is a place, not, well, this is the kind of thing we do in Rockland. That's why they created it this way. And that was the right way to do it. 
And also remember, this significant, and this was raised in Weymouth, and I don't know if you were at the meeting, but what happens if this doesn't go forward? There's 50 to $60 million worth of debt on this property. One of the questions we were asked, well, why doesn't this Rockland take its piece, and Abington takes its piece, and Weymouth takes its piece? Well, knowing, as I do, and then we work in state government, well then, by the way, Rockland's going to be looking at their share of debt to take associated with it. It, from a pure development standpoint, how to move this forward, look at it holistically as the base, realize there are tax and other benefits that are going to work directly to the communities, and let it be developed by the Redevelopment Authority, which includes representatives in your community. That's, that was the overarching theory behind it. And, you gotta, and that exists today, and the idea that we can somehow change that, I mean, it is the creature of legislation. We can't change that. And by the way, I would suggest to you, forgetting about the fact that we want to redevelop it, you don't want to change it. Because the state is then going to say, okay, this failed development, somebody owes us that $60 million for the Senate. You don't want to do that. Forgetting about whether you support us or not. Mary? I'm just going to say this. You're talking to people in this room that took part in the legislation back in 1998, back in 2014. Um, no, it wasn't strictly the developer created the legislation. There are people in this room that took part in that and have been involved all along. No, this is not just a one development thing. It is the three towns. And what we need to know is, when are you going to put a shovel in? Good evening, Mary. I'll do the chair. I'll answer that. I'd like to do it as soon as possible. No, you need to, to actually tell us, because we need to know. We've Mary. heard you say 10 to 15 years. But you're coming and wanting our vote. Absolutely, because if, if you looked at our overall timeline, we have to get the zoning approved. We have to move forward on the water and sewer and the plans. We have to amend the legislation. We have to fix all the state permits and approvals. Our goal is to have that done by the end of next year so that we then could be building in 25. That's our goal. And that's, we've said that at every one of these meetings. Then come back in 10 and 15 years when you've actually shown us what you've done and we'll have a vote. Well, how do you do that if you don't give us the rights to be well, able to start this? Un no, unfortunately, you can do your stuff right in Weymouth right now. There's nothing stopping anything from coming in there. Well, this is you don't want this to happen, so let's No, no, that. that's not the point. Well, no, that is And do not um, try to pin that. I'm looking at your map, and you're not going all the way across. You're telling us that we're going to get the least revenue. You're showing us a map. Okay, where well, you don't go all the way along those runways that can be developed in Rockland. So don't try to claim that anybody's against it. I am asking you legitimate questions, and you're not giving me an answer. You have approximately, again, through the chair, approximately the same amount of developable land that you had before. It is true that Rockland and Abington have the smallest pieces of land for development. That is true. You actually in Rockland have probably the largest amount of habitat and open space. It doesn't have that much that it's less than Abington in development. But that hasn't changed roughly 70 acres or so that are developable, which was before and is now, is about what it is. But by the way, and you know this, from 2009 forward, we still have to go back through natural heritage and address the things that were not done by LSTAR in 2017 to fix the natural heritage permits and to allow developable area in Abington and Rockland. And that's one of the reasons that we're talking about. To try to figure out how best to do that and to create extended restricted <clears throat> land and more habitat. That's, in, that's what we're trying to do so that we can develop in all communities. But if you have 450 plus or minus developable acres, you've probably got about 20% in Rockland and probably got a little bit there's 449 that, acres the per the permit. There's 381 acres per the National Park Service. To, to, to the chairman, Mary, you talk about the people that were involved in, in, this, in the legislation. I wasn't involved in 1998 as I was four years out of high school, but I was involved in 2014 when we had the, the group that involved all the different boards. I was on the planning board at the time, the zoning board, conservation, town administrator, town accountant. You attended all the meetings. I was with you. You spoke 
very frequently at those meetings, and we talked about one of the importances was of the town to maintain open space and grasslands on the property. And it was an agreed back then when we did the, the, the zoning in 20, well, it was 2015, which was approved in 2016, finally, after our town meeting, was we were all in agreement. We all spoke in support of town meeting. You spoke in support of town meeting. And we in 2016. Can I, can I please finish? It was, back then it was 64 acres, today it's 64 acres. We have 64 acres of developable land. I am one that would like to expand our developable area, but I want to be sensitive to open space and the habitat, all the things that we have to consider, park and recreation land. Is there a time in the future we can look at it? Maybe, but right now, we need to look at today. And we need to look at, and we can't wait 10 or 15 years. 10 or 15 years, and we don't develop, it's gone. We'll have a nice parkway, and no development, and no tax revenue. That's my point. That's so. my point. You're telling us 10 and 15 years from now, no. you will develop something, no. but you want our vote now. Well, Mary, Mary I, don't, I never heard that out of John. And I, I did, over no. in Weymouth. No. Okay, they said it could take up to 10 to 15 years to, to completion. They want to start putting shovels in the ground in 2025. That may mean Rockland. It depends on a project. It depends on utilities. These are things that are just unknown at this point, but we're working on it together, cohesively. To, you know, there's no perfect answer. I had to say it, and I think Selectman O'Loughlin said it at, at our meeting in Weymouth. He said, trust but verify. We have to have some trust together. Residents, town, boards, SRA, developer, because there's not many options after this. I can promise you that. And I've, I've sat and watched the previous developer and what he did to this property, and then getting this developer. In some of the days, I wasn't sure how long we would be here, Mary. The SRA and what would happen to that land. There's over a million dollars in encumbrances that the SRA has to pay every 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 year for the budget, and and the developer pays 75 percent of that budget. We don't have a developer, we don't have a budget. We don't have terminal monitoring for hundred thousand dollars that we do every year, eighty-six thousand dollars we do every year. So we have to trust but verify. We have to work with our boards and our teams. And and as I said in my opening presentation, that this group is honest. You might not want to hear their answer, but it's the honest and it's the truth about the development. And they're being straight with us. And they're being straight to uh, get us to understand the project and the issues that we have to deal with moving forward. So I think, I think we have to, again, work together as, as a community and boards to make sure we are maintaining open space, we're maintaining developable land, and, and we're doing the right thing for the town of Rockland for the future, for new growth in the community. I think, Mary, we're going around in circles now, so the uh, last question. Uh, if I have two, that would be one. Uh, one Mr. 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 It'll need a follow-up. Uh, thanks, John. Just for the record, uh, I, I support the project. I'm not fighting you with any of those questions. I'm just looking for answers for, it, for the town. You know, so uh, so the, at another meeting, you mentioned uh, Abington building commercial, all commercial in Abington. Uh, so, I, so I guess my point is, uh, the question I have is, he, is it true that you can build up to 7,200 units of housing on the base? If commercial is, is, is Abington only going to be built commercial, that means there's going to be a lot of housing coming to Rockland. I don't know where you've heard that. But From you. No, what I, mm -hmm. what I repeated was a comment that was made by someone in Abington under the old plan that Abington would like to have commercial versus residential space, because one of the speakers in Abington said they believe that commercial space is advantageous from a tax standpoint as opposed to commercial. That's what you heard. And hear me saying that they're going to have all the commercials are all going to be in Abington. What I will say to you is this. The kiss of death for any of these types of projects when people say, well, you got to put the commercial here, or you got to put the residential here, or there's going to be so much of this, so much of that. It never works. You can't finance it. You can't structure it. Which is why we have never said that it's all going to be here, all going to be there. We are basically commercial developers. We do residential projects. We hope there's a lot of commercial development here. But where it ends up, and what type it is, will be determined by the market over time. That's what you've heard me say. You never heard me say that that's what I thought. I have to check the recording. But, uh, okay. That's it, huh? Good. All right. Uh, I think we'll close this now. I think everything has been done. I'm sorry, Donald, but we're going around the circus at this point. Uh, these are circus. These are circus. Yeah, they're not.
Mr. DeBoer, got anything else to say? Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Salt River Redevelopment Authority, thank you for your time and opportunity to come and present tonight and get the information out there. We look forward to the opportunity to uh, coordinate on a public hearing uh, when it comes time uh, in September. We're looking forward to that. Thank you for the time of the board members. Thank you. And we do strongly appreciate the courtesy to provide us tonight. hope this information was helpful. Everybody's got good feeling to make this work for Mary and others and, and, and Don and Mike. I mean, we want to get the best project we can. So again, thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, turn it back to you. Yes, it's the existing building code. Um, this rendering actually had the, the architect put both buildings on so you could see what it looked like. So um, the existing building and the addition. And you were wondering if we could um, finish off the existing building if we did an additional permit, we need to put this finish on the existing building. Um, I'm going to ask you what's here. Uh, 
So yeah. this is the existing building. It does not have this. I'm sorry. This is the existing building. Yeah, and this is the addition. So just to make it complimentary. So we started clearing a lot. We've unearthed all kinds of things. <laughs> so it'll be a project. Yeah. Yeah, so um, after we were discussing that today as to whether or not we had space to leave them on the ground or we'll put them on the Right now we'll put them in a couple of we're not putting rooftops on it just because of that. Um, the original building sprinkle? Yes. And you'll be carrying sprinkle? Yes. Um, <coughs> July. <laughs> Sorry, June. Actually, now that I'm going back to the hard drive, I think I do remember that.
Did you meet with the uh, Howard Department? Uh, there was some discussion on who coming in the day or time. Yes. Um, the water and sewer. Water and sewer for you? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 mentioned if I put uh, panels, you wanted to move it over. You also wanted to do it on the existing building? Yeah, we'd like to to make it complimentary. So, so the new fireplace like panels they're putting on the new section, you also want to put on the old section? So yeah, as well. Yeah, they'll have to get a building. That has to go over different. Yeah. Okay. No problem. I didn't want that yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's one right with this one. Same. Yeah, no, no, I don't know. Which isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. oh, I think we'll make the whole conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically telling you what product they're using. Mm -hmm. Exterior five? That's actually plywood and not aluminum? I thought it was um, like faux wood, wood, but it is real wood, he said. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I was going to say, fire treated? Fire treated? <laughs> But it went to the exterior of the building. Breaks it up. Yeah, they usually like that. Usually, you see like a loop of bond or some panels. All the fake wood they have up there now. Yeah, all the school, you know what I mean? Where they put the foul like up on the canopy. It's a pretty street up Do you have any questions? No, I'm good. John? I'm all set. John, I'm all set. Uh, we don't have any stamps on
I make a motion to approve um, with the condition that we receive the scan plans. No, so we can sign if you bring them in and everything, and next time you meet, you can sign them. Okay. Is that how you meet in August? Yeah. 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 And if you, if you can if you can get them into us, because we probably won't be meeting in August. But if you get them into us, we can all coordinate. Yeah, if you sign, want to. You know, get the signature and step, and then we can all meet up inside them so you can. Yeah, so if you get the three full sets this size and you bring them to the town clerk's office, um, they'll stamp them to let me know that they have them, and then I'll come and get them, and I'll meet up with everybody to get them signed. And then I'll reach out to you let you know when it's, when it's ready. Thank you. All right. Oh. Yeah. All those in favor? Uh, do we have a second on the motion? I do. All right. All those in favor of the motion? That's a vote. That's cool. Any other business? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Other business. Moving on to some administration, move the minutes from June 27th. Was that You were here. Charlie was absent. Oh, I was sent You were out. <laughs> you weren't here because I wasn't here. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Right. Sorry, second. All those in favor? So, there we are. I have a bill from PGB Engineering for three hundred thirty dollars, three hundred thirty dollars thirty four cents for a level academy. PGB Belmont, Belmont Parkway construction reviews. Money. We have the funds. Second. Okay. No, it's in favor. It's a vote. Yeah. Favorite right. part of the night. Favorite part of the night. Motion to favor the secretary. Second. Okay. <laughs> and we have first and second. All those in favor? It's a vote. Potential activity. Um, had an informal meeting today for somebody who wanted to do something on Union Street. And they're supposed to come back to us a couple of modifications. Let's we'll see how that goes. Schedules. We've got nothing on the schedule for August at this point. Okay. We're waiting to hear oh. back from the golf course mm -hmm. then when to be continued again. I did not say unless something comes up with schedule August. Yeah. Just, uh, just let me know on those things coming back from the I'm going to have anything long distance that I know from the Anybody else have anything? Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All those in favor? Vote.